Good Place creator and showrunner Michael Schur creates worlds that are very nice. The Office features a workplace that's really a family. Parks and Recreation portrays government workers who genuinely try their best to help their town. Brooklyn Nine-Nine features an NYPD police precinct that is generally kind to the public and always tries their best to solve the case. I'm not knocking any of these shows. I really love all of them. They're intelligently written, have fantastic characters, and are truly three of the funniest shows of the last decade. But this niceness can sometimes make them rain a tiny bit false for people. For example, if your real-world boss stepped anywhere close to some of the lines that Michael Stott crosses, you'd leave your job. You wouldn't consider him family. The workplace rarely feels like family. Politicians often don't have their constituents' best interest in mind. And the NYPD... Well, they certainly don't have a reputation for being all that nice. Michael Schur's shows ostensibly take place in the real world, but it's a world that feels a bit softer than our own, a bit kinder. Despite being set in modern America, it often doesn't feel quite real. Which is perfectly fine. These are sitcoms, after all. A genre that's never been all that focused on realism. But it's very interesting to me that Schur's most outlandish, bizarre show, the one that takes place in a truly strange, fantastic universe, is often the one that resonates the most with me. The show with alternate dimensions and demons and whatever the hell a time knife is. Somehow that show feels the most real. This is kind of an unusual video for me, because it has nothing to do with portrayals of history. But I've been increasingly intrigued by The Good Place throughout its run. It's incredibly unique, endlessly enjoyable, and I don't know if I've ever seen another show so interested in the idea of goodness. What does being a good person mean? Most episodes are generally based around a philosophy lesson, and the show makes learning about different philosophers and ideas pretty entertaining. Like, it's bizarrely fascinating to watch a moral philosophy professor forced to actually live out the trolley problem in real time as he becomes more and more drenched in blood. As a warning, I'll be spoiling all three seasons of the show, and if you haven't watched any of the show and are unspoiled, please stop watching this video now. Honestly, the first season finale twist is a real joy if you don't see it coming. Unless you're the kind of person who enjoys spoilers, which, okay, do whatever you'd like. The Good Place opens with Eleanor Shellstrop opening her eyes in a new world. She has just died and is told by Michael, an architect slash eternal being of some kind, that in death there is generally a good place and a bad place, and she has been sent to the good place. She learns that every action on Earth has a positive or negative point value based on how much good or bad that action put out into the world. Only the very best people get to live in paradise. Eleanor gets to live for eternity in a beautiful, harmonious community with her true soulmate who has been selected by the good place. She meets him, a very sweet and very anxious moral philosophy professor named Chidi. As soon as she's left alone with him, she confesses something. There's been a mistake. The good place has mixed up her life with someone else's. She wasn't a civil rights lawyer. She was a shady salesperson who sold fake medicine to old people. At first she thinks she can hide, but the neighborhood, being perfect and harmonious, seems to go haywire every time she does something selfish. So Chidi agrees to help her. He will teach her to be a better person so she can stay in the good place and escape discovery by Michael and their seemingly perfect neighbors, Tahani and Jianyu. Most of the first season revolves around lessons from Chidi and Eleanor trying to escape notice. Occasionally, they enlist the help of Janet, a sort of living Alexa who has almost godlike powers. After the first few episodes, we learn that Jianyu is also mistakenly in the good place. He's not a serene Buddhist monk, but a trashy, delightful Florida DJ named Jason Mendoza. Now, the basic setup of the good place received some pushback from audiences in the first season. To quote my roommate when we first watched this show together, I would be pissed if this was the afterlife. For one, the point system that ranks people seems to be somewhat tilted towards the rich. 
If you have the resources to become a human rights lawyer or a professor, your odds at getting into the good place seem much better than the average person. This is most personified in Tahani, a socialite who gave lots of money to charity, but is clearly somewhat shallow. Her favorite hobby is name dropping. Furthermore, the contrast between high and low art is all over this show. Some of the so-called crimes that can get you knocked into the bad place seem to be enjoying low culture. You can get points knocked off for liking the Red Hot Chili Peppers or The Bachelor. Now that I've popped your cherry, you don't oh need to talk about virginity <laughs> Yeah, no more, huh? I love see you it. soon. Yep, see you soon. But liking high culture, like opera or ballet, is revered. Indeed, the characters who are supposed to be in the good place love high art and philosophy, while the two imposters love Frank Caliendo and Kendall Jenner's Instagram feed. Now, I know most of these are just jokes about what things in our culture are good and terrible. In fact, the contrast between high and low art makes for some of the show's best jokes. But this is still supposed to be heaven. Why is heaven so concerned with class and its signifiers? And then there's the soulmate issue. A poly friend watching the first few episodes pointed out to me that they didn't like the idea of soulmates. We spend so much time on Earth stressed out about monogamous romantic relationships, it feels unfair that we'd have to do that in heaven too. And as a bi person, I have to admit that I was a little put off that all the good place couples seemed so heterosexual. This is paradise, wouldn't you want to mix things up a bit? You can't even spend time alone in the good place without some pushback. Lots of activities are designed just for couples. Often the soulmates concept seemed more like arranged marriages than true connections. These people did not meet before arriving in the good place. And often these connections seemed to make them miserable. They only maintain them because it's how the system is supposed to work. It almost calls to mind couples from the 1950s, pairing off because they're told they're supposed to form perfect family units even if they end up deeply unhappy and emotionally unfulfilled. The strangeness of this supposed paradise even comes down to design. This perfect neighborhood is all pretty pastels and looks like a planned community. It looks more like Celebration Florida, or The Villages, or Stepford, than Eternal Bliss. There's even a ton of frozen yogurt places, which are generally a sign telling well-off white people, hey, this neighborhood is done gentrifying, move on in. Is this heaven? A place where you can't even enjoy full fat ice cream? There's no counterculture in the good place, we learn all the artists have gone to hell, and you aren't even awarded the basic pleasure of cursing when you're angry. Somebody royally forked up. Somebody forked up. Why can't I say fork? The good place even gets Jason's race wrong. Heaven is so racist. The entire setup seemed horrific. The point system is so restrictive that only a tiny percentage of humanity gets into heaven. How could these people be happy knowing everyone they ever cared about is screaming in hell for eternity? How could enjoying the good place while most people suffer possibly be good? Well, then this system sucks. What, one in a million gets to live in paradise and everyone else is tortured for eternity? Then we reach the end of the first season, and we find out that, another spoiler warning, this isn't the good place after all. It's all a facade. These four are, in fact, in the bad place. The romantic pairings, the anxiety about being sent to hell, even the frozen yogurt, all of it was intentional. They're living in a hell specifically designed to torture them with their worst anxieties. This whole system has been built to make them miserable. Honestly, it should have been obvious from the beginning. I mean, they have to do chores. What kind of heaven makes you do chores? It's really interesting listening to the production designer, Dan Bishop, discuss how they designed this fake heaven. Places in the real world that work to create an artificial happiness, like Disneyland and shopping centers like The Grove, were heavily referenced. Even the font Eleanor sees when she wakes up is Futura, a bold, simplistic font that's frequently featured in advertising. Most famously, for years it was the official font of IKEA, a brand that advertises a stylish lifestyle but sells cheaply made products. It's appropriate for an artificial paradise. Michael decides to erase their memories and start again, and the next season shows him continually having to reset them over and over, 
because they keep finding each other, helping each other, and figure out what's going on. Eventually, Michael gets into a bit of a labor dispute with the other demons. We are on strike until our demands are met. Hell yeah, Vicky. And he teams up with the humans to try to hide this from his boss. In return, he promises to help them get to the real good place. Over the course of the season, we see this demon, who has for his entire existence been disgusted by humans and mainly wants to torture them, start to change. Part of this is because he's sitting in on Chidi's ethics lessons, but a lot of it is because he actually gets to know the people he's been torturing, and in spite of himself, comes to care about them. He finds himself actually wanting to help them, to make sure they do reach the real good place, and he starts fighting against his fellow demons to help them achieve this. At the end of the second season, our four main characters must go before a judge, who supposedly looks after all of humanity, but seems fairly divorced from the realities of being human. She gives them all tests to see if they are worthy of the good place. Some of these tests are incredibly harsh. Tahani fails her simply because she chooses to get closure with her emotionally abusive parents. The judge is ready to simply send them all down to hell before Michael manages to convince her to let them live a little longer on Earth and see if they can still improve. In the second season, we learn that not only is the neighborhood Michael designed hell, but there are issues with the larger universe. The demons don't seem to care whether the souls they torture are good or bad, so long as they get to keep torturing. Even worse, the judge looks at these four, coming to her, begging for help, and has no qualms about damning them, even though their crimes for entry into hell don't seem terribly bad. The elaborate, harsh point system functions as a jab at the traditional view of heaven and hell. These seemingly objective, cold, hard numbers puts the onus of goodness purely on the individual, rather than viewing it in the context of the society and systems in which one lives. Should a starving person steal bread to save their family? Well, in the world of the good place, no, no matter what. Even if your baby is about to starve, because if you steal a loaf of bread, it's negative 17 points. It's all a very strict, empirical, black and white view of the universe, and very tied into ideas about the Protestant work ethic, which, incidentally, was one of the things that led to the rise of the modern capitalist system, and one of the reasons American culture is generally so dedicated to the idea that work equals morality. In the third season, the four main characters start the season on Earth, but quickly the show gets back up to its afterlife shenanigans. By mid-season, they're trying to help friends and family get into the good place. They try to help people learn to make an honest living and feel happy in a good suburban lifestyle, completely secure in the idea that these things will bring people closer to salvation. And Michael and Janet hit upon the idea of trying to game the system, of finding a model human whose life they can use to teach others about how to enter the good place. But in doing so, in trying to learn more about the afterlife accounting system and how it works, they discover something horrible. The office that tallies points has what they believe to be a perfect algorithm for determining who's good and who's bad. There's all sorts of checks and fail-safes in place, so they are utterly convinced it is never wrong. Even though, as we learn, the point system has not sent a single person to heaven for the past 521 years. That honest living, that good suburban lifestyle, none of it will help humanity. The system is damning all of them. The accountants don't even seem to register the absurdity of this when it's pointed out to them. They just completely assume that they cannot be wrong. Michael has a moment of panic here. He assumed he would find answers, that someone would tell him what to do. But Janet reminds us that if no one else will help, if no one else is interested in saving humanity, then they must do it together. They all break into a kind of mail room in the actual good place. Unfortunately, they can't get past the door. But Michael sets a meeting with the angels there and tells them his suspicions. He believes that the bad place is messing with the point system. He's relieved when these angels seem appropriately concerned, but then they tell him that their groundbreaking plan to solve this horrible problem is to form an investigatory committee. They plan to spend 400 years simply selecting committee members to ensure they have no conflicts of interest. When Michael begs them to understand that, for every century spent worrying about procedure, billions of humans will be horribly, mercilessly tortured, the committee assures Michael that they've written a memo about how deeply worried they are about this. 
As Michael seethes in irritation, Tahani attempts to talk to him about a complicated situation that she keeps inadvertently making worse. This leads Michael to an epiphany. He compares the points of a man who gave flowers to his grandmother hundreds of years ago with a modern man who performed the same act. The man from the past received over 100 points for making his grandmother happy, while the modern man lost 4 points because he ordered the roses on a smartphone made by exploited workers. The company growing the roses used pesticides that harm the environment, and the money ultimately went to a CEO that harasses his employees. It's here when we realize that humanity being locked out of the good place for 500 years is very specific. In interviews, Michael Schur said that they intentionally lined up the timeline with when colonialism by Western powers began. This is when early capitalism began to truly get its grip over the world. No ethical consumption under capitalism has become a constantly said phrase on the left, so much so that it often loses meaning. It almost becomes an, eh, what can you do, rather than an acknowledgement of the horrors that capitalism can unleash upon the world. But here, this show reminds us that as much as we don't like to think about the exploitation behind nearly every purchase we make, the consequences still exist. In this system, there is suffering behind nearly every aspect of our lives, from using our phones to picking up a Subway sandwich for lunch. And The Good Place tells us here that all of that suffering builds up over lifetimes. Each little choice contains a thousand other horrible choices made by corporations that you'll never know about. In the world of this show, this builds and builds negative karma until it becomes impossible, even if you have lived your whole life in self-sacrifice, to achieve enough points to enter paradise. Capitalism has effectively doomed humanity to a torturous hell. Our heroes petitioned the judge and asked her to stage a new experiment. They said that they were able to grow, to learn to be good people when they were freed of the worries of modern life, when they didn't have to, for example, worry about paying rent. They think that if this experiment was staged again, other humans would follow their example. In other words, maybe humanity can only be free to grow and become better once liberated from the concerns of capitalism. All of the fighting factions decide to stage an experiment that could save or doom all of humanity. They will send four new humans to the fake good place and see if they can learn to become better people there. This sets up the fourth season, and I won't completely spoil the third season finale for you, but oof, it was a punch in the gut. Just, oh wow. When you zoom out and look at the show The Good Place as a whole, it becomes clear that it's not just a show about how to be good, but about how to be good in a bad system. A system that's at times varyingly actively out to get you and make you miserable, or coldly indifferent to your suffering. Not only is the first universe Michael creates a hell for its residents, this entire universe is a hell. The individuals running this universe seem to be completely on autopilot. They just keep running through a system they assume is still working without interrogating its major flaws. Which sounds familiar somehow. The accountants are certain in the effectiveness of their algorithm, even though it's clearly failing. The angelic committee in The Real Good Place seems much more concerned with process than actual action. And the judge, one of the wisest beings in the whole universe, whose job it is to judge humanity, is so checked out from the reality of life on Earth that she seemingly has no concept of racism, one of the major causes of exploitation for the last several hundred years. Furthermore, though these beings are quick to judge the morality of humans, they never stop to interrogate the morality of what they are all complicit in, torturing billions of people for all of eternity. The system doesn't even really seem to provide these eternal beings with much real benefits. They don't seem to particularly enjoy it, yet they keep participating in it, even after the point of cataclysm, even after the point where all of humanity is doomed. Even those in a position to stop it don't seem that concerned, because they assume that this system is the only way things can be done. As Michael says at one point, the Titanic is sinking and they're writing a strongly worded letter to the iceberg. The only beings who seem to be truly enjoying themselves are literal demons. There's also the added general Michael Schur nice aesthetic that makes the whole thing even more horrifying. It's got the bright, cheery sitcom lighting, the same smiling faces seemingly trying their best, but here it's just a veneer over something horrific. Schur has explored this before in Nosedive, an episode of Black Mirror that he co-wrote with Rashida Jones. In that episode, a very nice, pastel, Instagram filter-looking future, filled with people who are very nice on the surface, 
is simply a light cover over a horrible dystopia. I think this concept is used in The Good Place to an even better effect. This smiley, sweet universe is a cold, cruel bureaucracy based on hard numbers that doesn't care about the human suffering it perpetuates. It's the Lovecraft mythos, but instead of tentacled, unfathomable monsters, your fate is controlled by a corny bad manager with an existence's best boss mug. The good place depicts a system where the points are stacked against you, where you live through a game you can never win, a universe that cares very little for human happiness or quality of life. How can someone be good in such a bleak system, in a universe that ultimately cares little about goodness? Well, The Good Place also provides us with an answer. At the end of the first season, Eleanor says something unexpected for someone who's just learned they're in hell. This is wonderful. She elaborates. You thought we would torture each other. And we did, for a little. But we also took care of each other. We improved each other. And the four of us became a team. Eleanor here has figured out how to beat the devil. Underneath all the moral dilemmas and philosophy lessons, it's really quite simple. The key not only to goodness, but salvation, is friendship, is love. Ultimately, it's their relationships with each other that lead the humans to find out Michael again and again. And it's only after they develop an unexpected alliance and then friendship with Michael, and only after Janet becomes more and more human through her relationships with them, that they are all able to challenge the bizarre moral system of this universe together. For example, at first when Chidi hears Eleanor rant about how this system sucks and things should be different, he simply says, I agree, but that's not the way things work around here. He's clearly distressed that Eleanor might end up being tortured for all of eternity, but he doesn't think the good place, the system, can be challenged. Yet after getting to know all of these people, after endless experiences with them, Chidi is the one who's able to challenge this system most radically. He's the one who proposes the experiment that might save humanity. It's only through the developing relationships of our main characters, as they learn together and grow and change, that they realize things can be abended. The system isn't fair, isn't good, so they have to change it. Finding alliances and relationships in unexpected places, finding a common, righteous cause, fighting through alienation and loneliness, building solidarity with people you wouldn't normally talk to, finding love. It's only through these things, through relating to and caring about the fellow people you're here with, that we can find some goodness in an unjust world. It might even save humanity. So why does this insane, over-the-top show about the afterlife ring so true to me? Well, because the world we live in is cruel. We're constantly shown visions of happiness, of what we should want. A perfect, safe community, commodities to satisfy our needs, the idea of a perfect soulmate. We're told we can achieve success and happiness by doing the right things in the right order, as if life is a game you can win by storing enough points. But more often than not, this doesn't lead to happiness, it leads to frustration. We fail to live up to the unrealistic expectations set out for us and blame, not the system, but ourselves, over and over again. Furthermore, we're constantly put in conflict and competition with the people we're here with. We end up torturing each other. And this system is set up to fail. It's harder and harder to function in this world. In fact, if we were freed from this system, it would likely be easier to solve our problems, become better people, be fulfilled. Yet those in charge keep telling us that this system is correct, that the markets and algorithms that govern our lives can't possibly be wrong, that we should have faith. And over all of it, preventing us from seeing how bad things really are, there's a veneer of civility, of justice, of niceness. This system is unjust and must be changed. It's dooming humanity, and none of the people in charge want to change anything. The so-called good guys don't seem that interested in sweeping solutions or real change. The only ones who seem to be enjoying themselves at all have no qualms about hurting most of humanity, and maybe even enjoy it. And what those people love most of all is watching us torture each other. So to change things, we must fight that urge and instead take care of each other. What makes things bearable, even wonderful, is our relationships to people around us. 
Friendship is a flashlight in the darkness of our capitalist world. It's caring about other people, forming community, building true empathy and compassion and love that allows us to be good people in a bad system. And it's only through developing relationships with other people from different walks of life, through fighting through alienation and cultivating love, that we can bring about a system focused on people, not products or algorithms or markets or arbitrary points, but humanity. A world not just about being nice, but being good. Hey everyone, thank you all for watching. Thank you for indulging me and listening to me talk about a show I really, really liked for a little bit. I have a few more exciting videos planned that I'm in the process of writing, including one about police procedurals. I can't wait to get those out. I have a Patreon and a coffee if you'd like to donate. And that would be really helpful this month because I do recently find myself in the position of having to find a new job very quickly. Though also, if you know of any places that are hiring, uh, let me know. That would also be helpful. I realize this networking is really ineffective because I'm an anonymous voice on the internet and most of you do not live where I live. But hey, figured I'd give it a shot. I also want to thank all of my lovely patrons, especially Luna Schindler and Rowan Quinn. You're all wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, everyone. See you next time.